And good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter Jan Grek, and on behalf of my fellow directors and the chairman of the Malta Business Network, Mr. Joseph Zametabona, please allow me to welcome you all to the Malta Business Network's second webinar for 2021, titled COVID Shockwaves, Implications for the Maltese Economy. Our host for tonight is Mr. David Valencia, managing partner at PwC, and our distinguished guests are the Honorable Minister for Finance, Mr. Clyde Caruana, the Honorable Shadow Minister for Finance, Dr. Mario De Marco, David Shuirep, President of the Malta Chamber of Commerce, and last but not least, Dr. Gordon Cordina, the Chairman of Bank of Valletta, who will be kicking off this afternoon's session with a presentation. Before I pass on the proverbial mic to David Valencia, let me remind everybody that you can ask questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom tab. And um, without much further ado, David, over to Hi. you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, welcome, everyone. First of all, I think it's a privilege having uh, the panelists um, here today. Um, I'm going to apologize up front. Should I have to interrupt any of you? Obviously, we've, uh, you know, there's a lot to, to cover, so we want to try and keep the, the conversation flowing. Um, we're going to start, as Peter said, with a, a presentation given, uh, given to us by uh, Dr. Corradina, and then we'll, we'll start to have a discussion surrounding that presentation and a few other topics uh, that, that we have. So, Dr. Cordina, please. Thank you very much, uh, David. I will be sharing my screen, my presentation, uh, which uh, I hope will serve as a point for discussion going on into this event. So, we are now living in uh, the shockwaves of uh, COVID. Of course, uh, perhaps an episode which has prolonged far more than the original expectations which we had mm, round about this time last year or a bit later than that. And uh, whose resolution, of course, remained somewhat uh, tenuous, but uh, seems to be closer at hand, so then the questions uh, will then be how to emerge and uh, restart in the most competitive way possible. Some idea of a longer term perspective in terms of uh, GDP movements in real terms for Malta over the past 20 years, plus the implications of uh, COVID. Of course, we were experiencing the substantial growth, uh, practically started in 2014, driven by what I believe to be three essential sectors, uh, gaming, uh, construction, and uh, tourism, with all the multiplier effects that are attendant with these injections, um, uh, only to be followed by a slowdown in growth, which to some extent was already being expected prior to the time, to the day that COVID got into the news. Uh, we were already discussing uh, way back in 2019, uh, how to manage a more sustainable, but sustained pattern of slower growth, which could see us reconcile the need to create further jobs coupled with better incomes, but also considerations of wider aspects of uh, well-being, including the environmental and uh, social fabric and, and cohesion. COVID uh, suddenly turned that idea of a managed slowdown into a reality of an old slowdown because of the obvious demand side effects, mainly brought to tourism and hosting and retail, but also secondary sectors. Uh, which happened because of this unexpected event. The um, dark gray bars indicate original forecasts as a result of the COVID event. The yellow gray bars indicate the revised estimates or, or forecasts because of the um, uh, more recent outturn of the episode. So we see that 2020 turned out to be far more, far worse than originally expected, only to be followed by a hope of further recovery from a very low base 
starting from from this uh, year going forward. This is the shape of the Maltese economy pre-pandemic as up to 2019. One is always, of course, um, uh, pleased to see so many colors of different activities in such a small economy, which indicates a high degree of diversification, which would also uh, lead to fundamental strengths of being able to manage against certain risks. But of course, we always need to be aware of the fact that all these colors may in effect also be silos which are not so much corresponding with each other, uh, such that it is not necessarily the case that if any one sector takes a hit, there would be others ready to take up the brunt uh, of, of that. In fact, what we can see is that perhaps the main sector which were affected by the COVID event, uh, which constitutes almost 30% of our economy, experienced drops in their gross value added, ranging from almost 10% to up to 65%. Other sectors did not do as badly and actually have managed to continue growing. So this was very much out of solidarity, yeah? whether the declining sectors with their negative effects would be significantly offsetting the growth in the other sectors which continue the, to perform in spite of COVID or at times because uh, of COVID. At the end of the day, of course, we know that the negative effects over to the positive ones, which negative effects, as we can uh, imagine, uh, concern the accommodation and food sector, uh, transport and storage, administrative support services, and of course the wholesale and retail, which were conditioned by basically a forced slowdown as the, the transport and tourism and related services. But we noticed the continued growth of other sectors, which have contributed to soften the, the COVID blow, such as ICT, arts and entertainment, construction, real estate other services such as financial health and education. But of course, our economy remains very much overweight, very much exposed to, let's say, bread and butter tourism of a mass nature, which, uh, of course, took the brunt of uh, this uh, type of event. So uh, the drop in GDP was, of course, only to be expected. Government support was key to mitigate these risks. Uh, and here one cannot overemphasize the, the preparation for a rainy day in such a small economy, which is also to, bound to be uh, vulnerable. And therefore, the residues that came through what is often called as the war chest, uh, which basically consisted of a very, very low debt to GDP ratio being over around 40% by 2019, and of course a fiscal surplus position. Well, that allowed uh, an element of fiscal headroom for the government to inject finances, which while not perhaps being, or cannot be effective to stop the drop in demand and drop in, in GDP, it was extremely successful in maintaining employment levels and in maintaining the integrity of the productive sector of the economy. And the number of bankruptcies in Malta were very low as compared to, to, to other countries, and that will allow us to hopefully rebound when demand recommences from a position uh, of, of strength. Of course, the, a lot of uh, efforts so far have been through the provision of liquidity support. Now, one course is concerned that these temporary aids cannot continue into the indefinite future. The country's war chest, though substantial, is limited. And at the end of the day, there is a limit to which firms can continue to absorb losses, even though they might be supported through better liquidity also 
because of disputes of lending which were launched. Here is my idea of what is going on with the strategy to cope with COVID-19, perhaps in terms also of a timeline, which is split in three phases. The first phase was about maintaining the integrity of firms and of households, which are of course exposed to mortgages while their jobs are being threatened. The effort spent on this type of activity starting in March 2020 was of course substantial, but one can expect this to be weaned off as time goes by to be replaced by efforts which are sustaining the demand to reactivate business. And here is the importance of continuing to support household incomes, continuing to help business with their cost management, their, their, their investment programs, to finally go into a phase where we will be investing even more heavily to be able to be competitive in the new post-COVID-19 world, where we all hear about the importance of sustainability, uh, digitization, greening, mobilization of substantial EU funds, which the country will be uh, receiving and of continuing to invest in our workforce. Really and truly, things which we have been advocating for more time for many, many years now, including the need to specialize in niche high value of tourism, but which possibly through the COVID event have now acquired a greater degree of urgency in terms of their implementation. I believe that this requires a vision of where we need or we would like our country to be by 2025 and perhaps beyond, both in terms of our demography, where our population is going, how many jobs we should be creating each year, what kind of jobs, the social outlook in terms of health and uh, uh, poverty and education attainments, in terms of the environmental outlook, where we want to go with our renewable energies, transport, waste, and uh, protection of landscapes and land management, which is such a key issue in Malta which should be translated into business development priorities. What kind of business do we want in Malta? Uh, now that we have grown so far, uh, the Minister of Finance this morning gave a very good speech on the need to wean away from growth and into development. And perhaps if I can interpret this thinking in this slide, that means going away from absolutely just the creation of jobs into a more selective type of business, which focuses on well-being, climate, social quality, innovation, infrastructure. Business itself has to create these conditions, of course, aided by government support, where government has to play a key role. Probably the one of the most uh, important factors of competitiveness in years to come will be the efficiency with which governments are supporting their Economies. Business will remain critical to competitiveness, but the efficiency of government operations will probably be even more so given the big role that is being given across the EU and really across the world to the roles of government in order to overcome the current stage. And of course, these elements should all be applied to the various colors of the Maltese economy the various dimensions, sectors. I hate using statistical definitions of sectors. To my mind, Malta has only four sectors. Those that are tourism related, which essentially depends on the quality of our environment, the quality of our products, the quality of life overall. And many, many businesses depend on that, with education, health, short-term work, creativity, and so on. Those activities based on innovative regulations, such as gaming, financial services, the activities which are still relying on cost competitiveness of our labor and of our resources, which are still important in Malta because a substantial part of our labor force has the aptitude to work in these sectors, such as manufacturing and logistics. And let us never forget that there is a substantial chunk of our economy, which is not subject to international favorable activities. So they focus purely on the domestic economy. 
but they also have a critical role to play in sustaining competitiveness, in sustaining efficiency, because their clients are those firms, those entities, which at the end of the day must then export. So it is a complete se sector approach which we have to look into here in applying these strategic priorities, all then leading or leading to the kind of economy and society that we want to see in five to ten years' time developing in this country. Therefore, we hear almost every day of the uh, recipe where we want to go. Uh, green infrastructure is uh, the most working and uh, commerce, digitalization, redirecting most of products and brands towards market niches, and of course, addressing the persistent challenges in education, because at the end of the day, at the day it's useless to introduce robots and AI, whereas our human capital cannot keep the pace to one day compete to be even better than these robots and these AIs in order to deliver uh, economic growth. And we are also living in a world where shocks are coming from a number of different directions. Uh, it's a bit like steering your kayak head into a wave, whereas you have another wave approaching from, from your side, which could likely be even more dangerous. And we know what these uh, shocks could be. Uh, growth in the trading partner economies, it won't be over when the health problems in Europe globally. The other economies will need to recover before we start experiencing some substantial increase in the demand for our goods and services so that is why we must be prepared for that kind of delay going forward uncertainty surrounding brexit which although the deal has been more or less achieved brexit is still the moment to suspect for our economy for a number of sectors the uh, issues which may arise with corporate tax reform with the sustainability of house prices the restructuring of state-owned enterprises uh, there are number of them, especially big ones, uh, which are strategic and which are critical to our future performance. Let us not forget that the specters of the past will still come back to haunt us, such as the rising pressures of the population aging. Uh, that is a problem which we need to tackle, perhaps less from the perspective of aging, of pensions going forward, as much as from the perspective of providing long-term care. Uh, which is what these population will start to expect in line with that provided by other more developed EU countries. And of course, we have to watch out for the institutional assessments uh, by money and similar entities in order to sustain our reputation and present ourselves with our best foot and attracting international figures to the country. A couple of words on the uh, role played by. Bank of Valletta, um, uh, high demand, let's speak the post high demand for the supportive measures, uh, moratoria, working capital finance. We have served more than 3,000 customers, deferred collection by almost 80 million. And uh, of course, we launched uh, the schemes to support uh, SMEs in line with the MDB COVID 19 uh, schemes. And uh, during the year, 400 customers were granted finance for amounts in excess of 280 million, which is a really substantial part of the total effort that has been done in the economy. So the bank remains a key and active player despite challenges which it is facing not only from COVID, but also from a number of areas, as we know, including the very low interest rate environment, which has been characterizing our work for the past two years, as well as the regulatory and compliance challenges which have affected the entire banking sector. We look forward with optimism, just as the economy can look forward to niches, digitalization, technology, human capital enhancement in order to sustain its growth. The same approach will be taken at Bank of Valletta, and I hope to be able to be part of the team which will lead Bank of Valletta in this direction, which will also serve the bank to be placed once again as a thought leader in this economy to 
give an example to others on how to transform and restructure to face the challenges of the future. We have launched a strategy, BOV strategy 2023, which will see us through this process over the coming years based on three pillars. One, we will be transforming and digitalizing our operating model when it comes to transaction, all processes with the subject of notification. And at the end of the day, that will lead to a service model transformation, which will introduce cost effectiveness within all of our processes. Cost not only in measure in terms of money, but even more importantly, in terms of time, which is key to competitiveness. We need to rebalance our balance sheet. As we know, deposits are no longer welcome at banks, more or less these days. Money doesn't, money liquidity doesn't attract uh, rewards anymore. It is actually penalized in this low interest rate environment. So it will be our business to redirect that liquidity towards more productive, longer term financial investment in an economy where households are excessively exposed to real estate when you compare to the situation in other new area economies. But on the other hand, that is being made up for by an excessive exposure to liquid assets. The transition in between of longer term financial assets for pension funds for life insurances, which is much more prevalent in other Eurozone economies, is perhaps significantly underdeveloped in Malta and that is an opportunity and really a need to migrate away from excessive liquidity and into this kind of longer term finance, which will produce better results for our customers. And thirdly, all this will be leading towards superior value to our customers, both in terms of the provision of finance, new business banking solutions, especially those based on digital and mobile technologies. And of course, this will then, then be leading to customer acquisitions from a lifelong perspective of the mortgage to life insurance to the effective pension. So that will be a complete service model, which perhaps only a bank can continue to uh, provide as opposed to other fintechs, which tend to be relatively limited in their uh, service offering. So we really look forward to play this important role in our economy and support the restructuring that will be going on on a more macro level. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Over to the table. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Um, if you can stop sharing. This is where I am extremely challenged. I'm doing <laughs> Not a problem. Let me, let me let me just kick off whilst you sort that out. I'm going to start with a like a thank you. Well done. I'm going to start with a, just a quick fire question to the panelists. Um, both Dr. Cordin, I, I think the central bank are suggesting that in 2021, Malta's GDP will grow by five percent, five point nine percent. David, yes or no? Will we achieve it? Yes or no? I hope so. Um, uh, yes or no? Not a hope. Your view? It's a difficult question. Um, uh, I hope so. Um, there are many risks which which worry me. Um, however, there is a lot to do to make my my answer a yes. There's a lot to do which I still see needs doing. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, fine. That's fine, Dave. Mario. Uh, many unknowns, uh, very hard to predict. We definitely hope we will make it. Uh, the EU forecast is slightly less optimistic. Uh, it's, it's predicting a growth of 4.5 as opposed to 5.5. Yep. Uh, let's hope for the best. I mean, we have a resilient economy, we have a resilient workforce, and I think if we all get our hats together, we can make it. Thank you. Gordon, I'm assuming you believe we'll, we'll get it, given... Uh, what you've just said. We're far more about employment than about GDP, uh, David, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, as long as people sustain their jobs and possibly improve them in these very difficult circumstances, that is my benchmark and my preferred baseline. Okay. Minister? Well, in terms of GDP, of course, it will depend what is going to happen this summer in terms of tourism. Um, so everything 
at the end of the day, will boil down to those numbers, whether it's going to be five in the whereabouts or less. Uh, however, as, as Dr. Cordina uh, rightly pointed out, uh, so far since March, we have managed through uh, government's intervention to help people remain in jobs. Uh, and that is something that, in a way, we have some control over. So um, uh, it's government intention that over the coming months, of course, we will have to continue with our current efforts. Perhaps there are areas where we'll have to intervene a bit more. Uh, but since we have managed so far to be so successful, uh, we have to continue with our efforts in order to maintain what we have achieved so far. Uh, Minister, so let, let me just continue con continue with you on this topic. Um, a lot of people obviously are, are, are curious to see what government's intentions are in terms of continued support, wage supplement, etc. <laughs> um, Gordon made reference to, to our debt to GDP ratio, which is which is which is uh, relatively healthy, etc. Your view: um, How long is this going to go on for? Oh, I mean, <clears throat> for sure, the way I see it. Um, we will have to continue beyond March, for sure. I would say that for certain industries, um, the, the wage supplement will have to be for a longer period relative to, to, to others. Um, it's hard to say when everything will stop because we have to see what the numbers in terms, as I said earlier on, what the numbers in terms of tourists will be. Uh, I mean, if we look at tourism, the total amount of money spent from the tourism industry when we used to have uh, at least 2 million arrivals and more was in the whereabouts of uh, 2 billion in terms of, of total um, spent. So the fact that tourism, I mean, even if you just look nowadays outside, uh, the numbers, the numbers are not are not there. So of course, that total amount of money spent has evaporated, and therefore it's having its impact not only on hotels and uh, restaurants, but also on the other um, businesses that cater for such for such industry. Okay. Mario, in terms of, of the opposition, what would you want to see from government in this, in this area? Let, let me do a Mario drive, uh, whatever it takes. Okay, we need, we need to do whatever it takes to, to save jobs and to save the economy. Okay, so in terms of wage supplement, uh, I think we need to give uh, a better forecast to business out there. Uh, companies out there need to plan and need to look ahead. And they cannot keep uh, deciding on whether to keep or whether to keep the workforce based on a monthly monthly basis or decision. March is with us. Okay. Uh, today, the prime minister hinted that the wage supplement will be kept beyond March. Uh, the minister, rightly, is also pointing out it will be kept beyond March. But I think we need to go beyond a guess game. Uh, we need to do what other countries have done and basically said, listen, till the end of the year the weight supplement needs to be there. I think it would be uh, a bit short-sighted trying to base our decision uh, on what's going to happen in terms of tourism this summer. Let's be very realistic. Tourism this summer is going to be very, very hard. So if we think that tourism is going to save the air for us this summer, I think it will be misleading people. It's going to be a hard summer. It's not going to be an easy summer at all. Uh, and God forbid we do the same mistakes that we did last summer with trying to attract uh, multi events to our islands. So let's be realistic and be conscious of the fact it's going to be a hard summer. It's going to be a hard year. Okay, which is why the government needs to do whatever it takes to save the economy, to save vulnerable uh, companies, to save jobs. Uh, we have a relatively low debt to GDP ratio. Okay, I'm not saying we can afford to throw money to the wind. We mustn't throw money to the wind. We need to use it consciously and sustainably, but we need to use it to save the farm. Thank you, David. Um, as a chamber, you've been very vocal, I think very, very involved in discussions with government. Um, 
what, what, what are you looking for, for government? Mario's, Mario's, I think, suggesting a bit more, if I want to use the word, certainty in terms of, of, of government support. I think the minister has hinted, if you like, that government are looking to support. Where do you, where do, where do you fall in this? Um, as a chamber, if the chamber was a union of employers, then it would be very easy for me to answer this question and say, of course, um, you know, weight supplement, uh, because that is what's going to save jobs and save uh, uh, businesses um, without much effort, because that's the easy thing to say from an employer perspective. Um, the truth of the matter is that whilst, of course, as we all know, the Chamber of Commerce sat right next to government and other bodies to draft uh, the the uh, the incentives and the and the, and the actions that have been taken uh, to be able to save uh, to conserve really the relationships between employers and employees way back in April last year right up to now, and only today we as a Chamber of Commerce uh, launched our CEO confidence index, and initially Im immediately show that compared to other countries we are the ones that have managed as a country to do this incredibly well. Um, the truth of the matter is that this should all alone will, will not resolve uh, our, 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 our problems and certainly will not take us out of, uh, of the after effects, if you like, of the economy of, of COVID. And what we need to see more of, and this is what as the minister certainly knows and most people, our members certainly know, is that we are insisting on active motivation for regeneration. Um, we cannot risk having people happy or comfortable receiving their wage subsidy and engaging with for months on end without any tangible effort being taken not only by government and the incentives that government can put forward, and those are very important, we need to see much more of those, but also on the business community that's able to, at this very point in time with such incredible uh, 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 confusion, if you like, that created, that should create opportunity, not take the opportunity of the disruption that COVID has brought about and re-engineer their business through proper business plans. Mm -hmm. We really need to see people think outside the box whilst, you know, benefiting from a weight subsidy that, in, that maintains the engines as they are today, do not shy away from doing whatever it takes to be better. I see... I see risk in this not happening. And that is why I would certainly be very, very, very motivated to engage with the right minds, with the right people, to do whatever it takes to re-engineer, to change, to upskill, to reskill, to move from one industry to the other, potentially, uh, as long as what it is that we're moving into is, is the vision that we all agree to, that we have drafted, that we want to we want to move towards whilst I'm spending all these monies 45 nearly 50 million euros per month in keeping things together as we move forward thanks david uh, gordon um there's a school of thought that suggests that in fact the the problems to our economy will be faced when government support is withdrawn or substantially reduced if you like um, and I'm linking this to a, to a question we just got as well. Um, as, a, as an economist, what's your view on that? Is, is that something to be, to be worried about? David, uh, governments exist uh, for three reasons. Um, and I'm sorry to refer to perhaps uh, an old textbook. There was a textbook in the 1950s, a couple of economists called Musgrave, husband and wife. But basically, said the government exists for allocation, distribution, and stabilization. Allocation means that where the private sector fails to provide certain goods and services, then the government should step in to pay for roads, health, schools, infrastructure. Distribution is here, the free market left to its own will result in poverty and therefore we should be supporting uh, only for the benefit of the economy itself, uh, social cohesion. And stabilization means that when the economy is going into downturns and eventually booms, 
this volatility is bad for investments, so governments stabilize by pumping money in recessions and taking away taxes in the days of war. I think right now this COVID is asking governments to do all the three functions at one go. We need it to, of course, stabilize the economy from the shock of a sudden drop of 3 billion euro, which we previously used to earn from tourism. I mean, as an economist, when I see a tourist, I don't see uh, a person, excuse the approach, but I simply see uh, 1,000 euro coming into the economy or something like that. When I see a cruise ship, I see 20 million euro coming into the economy. So that's 3 billion of cyclical effect, which has gone down the drain, which the government needs to compensate for. We have, of course, the distribution effect, uh, got to ensure that social cohesion remains there, that jobs remain there. And then there is the allocation effect in terms of sustaining, as we said, the stability of the enterprise and its competitiveness going forward. So it is really at all order. First of all, to distribute the cake that we have available, which big though it may be, is never empty between these three functions. And then not only that, to make it last for the time required to really see us through. And seeing us through is not just that I'm seeing a question there, the solution of the health issue, because the economic issue will last longer than that. And the need for new investments will be with us for far longer than that. And this is all uncharted territory, at least in living memory when it comes to economic crisis. The 2010-2009 crisis was far, far simpler. Ugly though it may have been, all that it needed is for central banks and governments to inject money. And the problem was solved, and that was why more or less also fared relatively well in those days. But now it's a question of getting bums on seats, as they say in the airline industry, and it's more of a physical problem now rather than simply a, a, a monetary problem. So I guess that we have to keep ourselves updated on a very regular basis, make decisions on uh, just that we have the health bulletins and the medical condition being monitored. It's the same thing with the economic situation, which needs to be very closely monitored at a micro basis, something which in Malta we have the luck to be able to do because of our smallness and relative agility in addressing their uh, problems. And I believe that through the right combination of restraint, targeted support, and wisdom in seeing us uh, going, going forward, there is, of course, uh, a solution and a uh, light at the end of the time. Okay, David, um, Malta's uh, GDP fell by 16.1% in quarter two and 9.9% .9 in quarter three in 2020, which was higher than the EU average, the EU average of 147 and 43 4 I mean, is this purely tourism, um, you know, or, or could we, should we be interpreting these, these, these numbers in a, in a different light? Um, well, tourism certainly had a major effect on this and uh, the lack of local consumption and everything that, 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 uh, that this is connected with. We have to remember, however, that our starting position compared to other countries was one of I think super GDP growth compared to other countries. So the correction in an island state that of course depends very much on its exports and then imports and uh, services that was that could be offered to the whole world. But tourism is certainly and the ancillary uh, facilities and the ancillary business that comes with that are very important. The fall, the, the, the relative fall that one could potentially expect in Malta, like for like, was meant to be higher because the starting position was was higher. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, as well, we also need to realize that um, the amount of money spent uh, uh, through government coffers to maintain our our economy going, uh, including the the money spent on on our health services uh, as as we went along, was was also significant, and we could afford to do that. 
certainly this is not sustainable. We cannot be below, uh, sorry, or higher than average spenders. Uh, we really need to to, uh, to 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 reverse this. And maybe, if I may, one other real concern um, that I have, that we have, as a chamber of commerce, is because we had been spending, uh, we, we had spent five to six years of surplus economy, economy in surplus, um, could have made us, if, if, if you allow me to use this term, comfortably numb. So we were comfortable. We did not need to reskill, upskill, educate, finish courses at university and MCAS. There was a lack of that, maybe updating of our education system. So the real risk we really run um, is if we are not able to be nimble enough, we are small, we're able to change uh, fast enough to reverse what was a healthy position we started at the healthy ability maybe to spend money to save jobs. But if we're not able to have the right infrastructure in the form of people and skills to be able to re-engineer ourselves out of this into what could potentially be, of course, an economy based on, on a zero carbon economy, a green economy, one based on good governance and quality across the board from construction to tourism uh, retail and everything else that is the basis of of, of what it is that uh, that runs our economy, then then that is a risk. So therefore, uh, our focus right now is in being aware of these of these uh, 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 risks of these weaknesses, if I may, areas for improvement for sure. Um, also identified, if I may, by the economic vision put together by the Chamber of Commerce in January last year. Um, analyzed through the COVID experience between March and uh, July last year, and clearly identified that these were our soft spots, our weak spots. And uh, Gordon, Gordon in his presentation um, addressed this. And this is our, our hope is to be nimble enough, we're small, regulate, incentivize, use our money wisely, um, and it, to be able to make sure that we are able to pull ourselves out and make sure that we also have the right infrastructure. It's not enough to dream of a vision of an economy without having the right infrastructure in the form of people and, digital, and the digitalization of our economy. So, Minister, just to, to, just to, to, to lead on again, you know, uh, people's opinions, people, different schools of thought. We're spending a lot of money on, on, on wage supplements, etc. perhaps even on industries that are going to be in difficulty even after COVID. Do you, I mean, upskilling is a, is a subject very close to my heart. Can government do more in this space during this period so that we can, so that, you know, industry can prepare itself for, for post-COVID? All right. So if we just go back by a couple of years following the financial crisis, there were a couple of uh, European member states whereby they did not enough in order to safeguard jobs uh, in their respective countries. As a result of this, it took Europe to fully recover from that financial crisis, which is by far, I mean, which was by far less in terms of damage relative to, to the COVID impact. It took them at least to recover uh, until the year 2015 or 16. So that uh, was about eight years or so later. And this was because they were not so decisive. So even though at face value, it may seem that some of the money, perhaps in inverted commas, it is being wasted because certain businesses will still go bust. I beg to differ um, in the sense that we cannot afford during such period to have pockets within our economy which go under because ultimately at the end of the day that will create ripple effects on other sectors of the economy. So right now it's very important that we make sure that what we have in terms of uh, businesses, they continue to operate and if any businesses need to go out of business, that is done in a gradual manner over a long period of time. Now, when it comes to upskilling, uh, about three weeks or four weeks ago, I have uh, initiated the process of consultation 
so that Malta will have an adjourned employment policy by October. I strongly believe that if we want to remain competitive in the years to come, we have to invest more in our human capital. Uh, I've said during that press, confer that press conference, and I reiterate that unfortunately we do not do enough in order uh, to improve our human capital in terms of resources. As we all know, we don't have uh, that many resources. Actually, we're quite poor in terms of resources. So if we really want to remain ahead, if we really want to enjoy a competitive advantage, uh, that competitive, competitive advantage has to come from our um, labor force. And therefore, uh, throughout this consultation process, I really want all the social partners to contribute their ideas in order to make sure that amongst other things, uh, we come up with something that is really solid in terms of proposals. It will, will be it will be backed up by the necessary financial resources because I strongly believe that if we want our economy to first and foremost develop and thereafter continue to grow, we have to strongly invest in our human capital. Thank you, Gordon. Um, there are a couple of questions. A couple of questions on loan moratoria. I mean, are those going to continue um, is one. And two, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot about COVID and that. There's also Brexit, yes, uh, for Malta probably, which is causing slight answer, a slight uh, discomfort as well. Your views on that, please. Yes, um, uh, with respect to moratoria, um, I mean, there are these regulatory or ECB mandated uh, uh, implications uh, on the extent to which this can continue or, or otherwise. Uh, and there is also the worry that is also perhaps expressed in a number of different countries and regions across the EU that uh, loan moratoria may not be sufficient to help businesses which run into solvency problems as opposed to simply liquidity. Uh, problems, and this is where, uh, of course, uh, the financial specialist can, can, can illuminate us much more than, than I can do. Um, uh, transversal shocks, definitely so. Uh, we cannot afford to be fully and totally distracted by COVID, uh, no matter how much important it may be. Uh, whatever strategy we are designing overcome the COVID period, we'll also have to keep in mind that we have to fashion them in a way which will also help us face the other transversal risks which we may, we may, may be facing, including uh, Brexit, which will of course affect our economy in a number of ways, be it with the supply chains or imports and exports when it comes to uh, customs and, and, and related uh, procedures, increases in prices or barriers uh, to that kind of trade. The negative implications on the uh, uh, UK economy itself and the consequent uh, results on the disposable income of households there and their ability to therefore spend their money as tourists uh, in, 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 our, in our country. So that is another important shock to, to look into. Once again, a shock which perhaps there is no parallel or close parallel in, 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 in our history to really compare to and therefore try to gauge um, the effects, especially when it is now compounded with, with COVID and other, 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 other effects as well. And therefore, I think that uh, whatever we do, uh, it has to be uh, proofed against these and other risks. Um, uh, this is why I believe that the strategy of sustaining jobs, the integrity of enterprise, and investing in the proper niche areas going into the future can serve as well, irrespective of the uh, type of risks which we are currently or which we might be then facing into the future as well. Okay. Mario, let me talk about another potential shock, Manival. First of all, your view, your, will we get through it? 
And, and secondly, you know, there are a number of reforms that have been put in, in, in place as, as a result of, of, of this review. Um, any lessons learned? So, uh, well, I, I definitely hope we do get through. I, I, I think nobody in his right senses would hope otherwise. Will we get through? Depends on many factors. Uh, we've seen a, a drive towards many reforms over the past year. Uh, the sad reality is that we could have avoided all this. Okay, because if one had to read thoroughly uh, the money gun reports, which was initially published, okay, you basically see that the main criticism was effectively against government, not quite so much having uh, not having necessary legislation in place, but for a lack of will of implementing that legislation. We basically then had the book thrown at us. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, we all know there were also a number of uh, FIU uh, reports uh, basically indicated that they had, uh, suspected money laundering activities against very high profile individuals against whom no action was ever taken and has not been taken to today. But we know where we are. So the sad reality is that we have suffered a lot as an industry, we have suffered a lot as a country. A lot of damage has been done reputationally because of the reports that happen. And even if we do pass through the Manival report, as we all hope that we do, the reality is that a lot of damage has been done in the process. And getting the reforms through has also come at a high cost for industry. Now, obviously, we must never leave any stone unturned okay, in the fight against money laundering. The world is saying otherwise, lest I be misunderstood. But the reality is that probably a lot of this could have been avoided. This is such an important industry. When before we're talking about uh, why has our economy perhaps been uh, has suffered more than the EU average. We all know that probably one of the realities is because we are still too much tourism dependent. Uh, and one of the things that previous nationalist administrations have done to make us less tourism dependent and to have more of a varied economy was precisely to introduce uh, different sectors, amongst which we have financial services and amongst which we have high gaming and also uh, aircraft maintenance and so forth. So financial services is critical. It provides good revenue to this country. It provides good jobs to this country. It provides high value jobs to this country. So from whatever perspective you see it, this is a critical industry. And this was an industry which would also have been uh, COVID resistant. So whereas retail and, and tourism were the obvious sectors to be impacted by COVID, uh, the financial services sector should not have been impacted by COVID. And in actual fact, it was not impacted by COVID, but it was impacted by the reputational damage which had occurred to our country. And by the reputational damage, it also occurred to our country as a result of the management reports and the results of various incidents which were related to the lack of good governance or other ones within our country. Now, obviously, it, it hurts us talking about this. And I, I, I really don't enjoy talking about this. But we have to do so. So now we need to realize how are we going to move forward? Uh, now, one, there was a time when we used to say that one of our major advantages as a jurisdiction was that there was I'd say unanimous consent, cross-party uh, approval of most of our financial services legislation. I think that the general approval of our financial services legislation still exists today. Uh, and most of the laws on financial services pass through unanimous consent within Parliament. And that gives also a degree of certainty to people who want to do business with Malta in Malta, 
in relation to financial services. But then there is a level of uncertainty which is also being brought about by one, not only the issue of reputation, two, not only by the issue as whether we will pass the money bars report or not, three, not by the issue as to whether we will be playlisted or not, hopefully not. But now there's also the issue as to whether will the tax system be changed or not. As we all know, there's a lot of pressure coming from within the OECD, also coming within the EU, as to whether we need to change the tax system. We also know that with Brexit, with the departure of the UK from the EU, we have lost one of our strongest allies in terms of tax sovereignty. Okay? Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have a voice on the matter. But obviously, when there are so many issues and there is still such a cloud hanging over our head, our voice has not become any stronger, but regrettably has become weaker. Now, what can we do to re strengthen our voice? What can we do to get out of the abyss that we involve ourselves in? I think we must leave no stone unturned in terms of issues of the governance. We need to show to the rest of the world, to the rest of Europe, that our reform within our justice systems, our reform aimed at anti money laundering legislation, is not simply a reform on paper, but is a reform of substance. That we really, truly believe in what we are doing. So when we reform, we must not simply reform for the sake of reforming, but because we know that not only there is no alternative, but because that is the right way forward. Good governance is not an issue of choice or of luxury. Good governance needs to be a formal mentis. It needs to be a mindset with which we want to move ahead with which we want to do business. Transparency needs to be existent at all processes, at all levels of government. So when we see a number of NAO reports attacking government transactions, contracts, public contracts, for lack of transparency, it impacts us. It may not be directly related to financial services, but it impacts us as a jurisdiction, as a whole. Mario, I'm going, to, I'm going to butt in because uh, obviously time is a thing and I, I'd love to, I, obviously I need to hear the minister's views as well uh, in terms of uh, are we going to pass money val and lessons learned. Mario introduced uh, the, the Malta's tax system under threat. So, you know, on that point as well, you know, what is required and what is the future? So perhaps, Minister, if, if you can give us your views. Okay, so with respect to money val, um, <clears throat> the number of steps that we have to go through vis-a-vis um, -vis that process. First, we will receive uh, the feedback from Manival on, on the final report, and that should be something over uh, by the end of next month, March. Uh, then following Manival, which mainly concerns uh, the institutional setup, laws, uh, etc. Then we will move on to FATF, where Manival is an institution within uh, the people who sit around the table of FATF. In FATF, there are other institutions such as the IMF, uh, a good number of EU countries, United States, and other um, countries. Uh, following the verdict from uh, FATF, which will take, of course, in consideration as well uh, the Moneval report, then um, there will be uh, as well um, uh, the, the Council of Europe uh, conclusions and that uh, I think it will be into whereabouts of end of May or beginning of, of June. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, there are a number of uh, hurdles that we have to go through with respect to the institutional changes that we had to do. Uh, I'm quite confident that ultimately at the end of the day, uh, what we've been asked to do 
has been done. Uh, in terms of challenges with respect to our tax system, as uh, Honorable Dr. Uh, DeMarco rightly pointed out, right now at OECD level, there is uh, discussion going on on what is referred to as BEPS2. BEPS2 basically is about the introduction of uh, minimum levels of taxation uh, across, um, I mean, a good number of countries. Uh, at ACOFIN, and this was pointed out even this week, um, last uh, Tuesday, uh, they've mentioned that again, they reiterated that even if there's no agreement at OECD level, the European Union uh, it has in mind the Commission to push for some uh, minimum levels of taxation across the board um, in the years to come. Of course, this is not something that's going to happen this year or next year, but the discussion is pushing in that direction. And this is a result of big economies like France and Italy, where uh, the government's purse are in dire straits. So, of course, um, the Commission is doing its utmost to raise uh, tax revenue even uh, for its own resources. Now, where do we stand as a country? Of course, first we have to go through the hurdles that we have ahead of us in the coming months. Uh, with respect to the minimum levels of taxation, uh, our the government's position is clear that we have something that we have negotiated before joining the EU. Uh, our tax imputation system, and we're quite adamant that we want to safeguard uh, what we have, but at the same time, we cannot ignore what is going around, uh, especially when, for example, the Commission continues to push for more uh, transparency uh, in terms of um, uh, tax flows, etc. So I strongly believe that once we're done with the, the test that we have ahead of us, we have to engage with uh, the big boys in Europe, namely Germany, France, especially those two, and start constructive dialogue whereby we hear more what they have to say and what they want to see from us in terms of tax transparency, because ultimately at the end of the day, uh, we have to make sure that we understand what are their worries, but also from their end, they understand that uh, a one-size-fits-all is not in the interest of everyone, especially for small economies like ours, which find themselves within the periphery of Europe. I mean, that is not something that we can ever, uh, of course, overcome because uh, the, the, the position of our island will remain where it is. And therefore, we have to make sure that constructively we put uh, and we push at the same time our arguments in favor of some form of flexibility, which allow jurisdictions like ours to have and retain some form of control over their tax system. Minister, just a, uh, just a couple of observations. Um, as an operator in financial services, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that this cross-party cross support in financial services in taxation. I think that is, is imperative, and I encourage both political parties to do this. And the second one is that there must be other countries in Europe who are going to be facing the same challenges in terms of this, uh, these pressures on taxation. Are we engaging enough with those countries to try and present as common a front as possible? Well, um, in terms of bipartisan approach, I'm all for it. And so far, what I can say, I've been uh, present in Parliament only since last October. Whenever I had the opportunity to say something in Parliament or in public, I've always tried to remain as impartial as possible, as technical as possible. And I want to avoid as much as possible any uh, partisan political discourse from my end, because I strongly believe that if one wants to win votes or perhaps to do something in order to favor one's own position, there's no need to be uh, partisan. So that is 
what I strongly believe in. With respect to to your um, second statement about whether we're doing something in order to have uh, alliances with other countries. Well, uh, as things stand right now, there is across the EU a qualified majority, that is there are enough countries which have enough percentage of the EU population which are in favor of having minimum levels of taxation. And from what I can understand, recently even the Netherlands have joined into this club. So uh, the number of member states uh, that continue to favor some form of um, tax discretion uh, is, is uh, going down over time. Um, uh, but uh, the Irish, Cypriots and uh, Luxembourg uh, they still, in a way, favor some form of control over uh, their, their tax rates. Of course, uh, in the coming months, I will try as much as possible to bridge with these countries in order to make sure that some form of alliance in terms of the arguments that we put forward uh, is formed between um, ourselves. But nevertheless, this does not... Uh, exclude what I've said earlier on, that if we want to somehow uh, preserve what we have, we have to be more transparent um, uh, with the big countries with, uh, in Europe uh, about uh, the companies um, uh, that, that are benefiting from our tax system. Ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, their main worries is that our tax system perhaps is being used for on, uh, for money laundering or uh, that somehow um, uh, we are getting an unfair uh, advantage over the tax systems that is by companies somehow wiring their profits over here. So uh, the more transparent we are, the more points we stand to gain um, with these countries so that ultimately at the end of the day would have more leverage in order to negotiate in the years to come. Thank you, Minister. David, um, we've obviously, the money value test is still on the, uh, coming, coming up, as the, as the Minister explained. Do you feel we're already, already experiencing fallout, for example, problems in opening bank accounts? overseas bank accounts. Are we are we, do you feel we're already experiencing fallout from this Moneyval process? Um, the answer to that is absolutely. Um, the effect uh, on our reputation um, over the last uh, couple of months um, on account of the stories on good governance and uh, Moneyval <clears throat> has initiated a lot of doubts on how trustworthy we are, I think, not only as a country, but also as business people. Um, certainly a number of our members um, narrate experiences wherein they do try uh, to develop uh, what would have been a normal business relationship to develop opportunities and economy uh, for themselves and of course for the country, only to find out that eyebrows are raised as soon as um, one realizes that the, ju the, the jurisdiction that we're in is ours, which is, uh, so I, I, again, I. I dislike talking about this, um, but the truth of the matter is that is the, that is clear. Um, there's only one way out, and I think as both the minister and Dr. DeMarco have mentioned, both, ha uh, you know, we need to be, we need to up our act. We need to work from a position of weakness. Our reputation is, is not easy uh, to, when there's something wrong with one's reputation, it's, uh, we all say it's not easy to repair. Um, uh, when one's reputation is on a high, it's easy to lose unless you you, you mistake, uh, you, you do any mistakes. One, the only way uh, how I see us uh, getting there faster than than the slow pace, <laughs> because it can't be any, any it can't be fast, is by all joining hands together and um, doing the right thing, putting our best leg forward. Um, certainly. Um, understanding that we have really done all that we could, 
not only at the level of the institutions of the government, but also at the le- at our level, at the level of business, we want to make sure that the good governance practices are in place, the investment not only in the listed companies, but in the small to medium companies are also in place. These are the feeder companies into the business. That money laundering is something that we understand, the risks of which we need to appreciate. If we get there, I would dare say also into our education system where good governance or being 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 uh, humble and, and, and integral and honest is something which, ha- which is not only virtuous, but also valuable. Yeah. Um, these are the structures and the systems we need to work on as soon as possible. But all of us, government, opposition, chamber of commerce, all the stakeholders, the tax practitioners, the, the financial services sector practitioners, we all need to be singing out of the same hymn sheet. And if things are right, we say they are right, vocally, strongly. If they are wrong, we'll, we'll need to sort it out. We cannot have open holes and uh, yeah, that we are aware of that are unaddressed, but we all have a contribution to make there. Most certainly, most certainly, David. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Gordon, because I, I realize we're, we're running out of time and I just want to bring in property and tourism into, into, into the conversation. So. Um, you've mentioned it. I think all the other panelists have, have mentioned it. You know, we need to more needs to change tourism. Are we going to still be looking for the three million tourists? Are we going to be looking for niche type of tourists? Yeah, you know, are we going to change our strategy in terms of, of tourism? Um, in terms of you know infrastructural investment, so we've got a lot of construction, you know, many units being built. That presumably is there because we were planning for significant growth in volumes of people. Um, Are we going to have to change? Are we going to have to amend? So even in terms of business planning, are we going to have to change our our plans because of of what's coming? Gordon? uh, We've passed, of course, to a period of uh, remarkable uh, growth. As I said earlier on, even prior to the incidence of COVID, we were already then discussing the next phase of a slower but more sustainable pattern of, uh, of, of, of growth or uh, development, as it can be more, more, more properly defined, uh, which I believe should be very much based on offering a quality of life business proposition, which can then serve for Malta to act as a regional business hub for the very many sectors that it wishes to host for production in this country. I think that we can agree that a quality of life proposition for a Mediterranean country with its unique characteristics as is, as is ours, will help not only to attract high quality tourists to our country, but above all, high value added uh, professionals who serve from here as a base, which is, if you want, a more permanent form of tourists, and which will not only contribute to consumption activity, but which will also generate GDP in our country with all the attendant effects. It will help further develop our financial services, our gaming, our uh, manufacturing sector of a uh, high quality, because quality of life uh, is uh, what most investors seek after, of course, that they have satisfied themselves, themselves of hygienic, so to speak, conditions such as efficiency, low cost of operation, availability of infrastructures, availability of uh, good, good governance. So without necessarily distinguishing between one type of tourist or the other, or one type of sector or the other, I believe that a concerted effort to this quality of life business model is key uh, for our country, which will entail environmental, social, as well as planning and infrastructural efforts all at one go in a constant uh, manner, which will, at the end of the day, benefit also, and especially the residents of this country. After all, economics is here to serve the development, the growth, and the aspirations of the population of the country in which we are living. 
Minister, are we in time to do this? Yes, sure, 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 sure. Right. Well, well, so you reckon in terms of, you know, all the development that has happened, people invested in hotels, and, and some very nice hotels, but some perhaps not so nice. You know, are, are we still in time to, to make corrections to, to our strategy, our, how we were moving forward in terms of, of, of this thinking? Well, I mean, the need or rather um, uh, the space in order to correct certain mistakes, uh, given also if, I mean, you're, you're referring to, to hoteliers in order to change um, certain mistakes that perhaps have been done. It's always there, especially during this period of low economic activity. Um, perhaps what, and, and I strongly believe that we should concentrate and focus on in the coming months, uh, and this gets me back to something that we were discussing earlier on, uh, is the need to make sure that uh, our finance remain sustainable because from what uh, I follow and what is taking place in the European Forum, European governments, most of them, they, are, they really find themselves between, uh, I mean, uh, a wall and, and, and a hard place. Um, and why is this important? It is important because it means that as long as we will have uh, the room where we can maneuver, any things that perhaps we got wrong over the past years, um, we can make sure that, of course, we try to get them right as much as possible over the coming years. But at the same time, as long as we retain our fiscal sustainability, that would ensure that we would not have the need to increase taxation. And this is perhaps one of the most important things in the years to come. Whereas other member states that will have to increase a lot of taxes in order to make up for their high debt to GDP ratios, this is not something that we have to do in Malta. And that, of course, will give us a significant advantage over others. I'm not, of course, discounting the fact that COVID itself uh, will bring upon us significant challenges uh, in the coming months with respect to certain businesses as they try to recover. Uh, granted, but at the same time, uh, not everything is gloom and doom. Other countries, they are also perhaps from uh, the government's fiscal position more hard hit than we are. And this is something that we should really uh, look into because of course it can give us that much needed advantage over other countries. Thank you. Mario, I'm going to bring in the green economy here. So first of all, are we still in time to, again, your views on, on whether we're still in time to make any, any corrections to our, to our infrastructure? Um, in terms of the green economy, because besides COVID, Brexit and everything under the sun, we also have you know, targets uh, that we are, we are meant to be uh, achieving. I understand that our 2020 target was meant to be 5% uh, more uh, than, than compared to 2005. I suspect, I, I don't know the number, but I, I, don't, I suspect we haven't there. We need to do a lot. And, and there is, a, again, heavy investment required in this space. Um, what should we do? Well, I mean, we're already lagging behind on all fronts in terms of, of the green economy. Uh, the only good thing is that there seems to be a renewed focus on the green economy. Uh, we're also, so we're seeing a global uh, emphasis, basically an emphasis on the global economy. I think also with the change of presidency in, in the United States, we're going to see also perhaps a new focus from the United States of America and its politics on the green economy. Uh, China seems to be also taking it more seriously. And I think that also if you look at the focus of the EU funds, the resilience funds, uh, basically I think we see that there is also a focus on use of EU funds on the green economy. Now, as a country, we have 
regrettably uh, lagged behind uh, because we did never really gave perhaps the priority we were meant to have given it. Uh, are we too late? No, we are not too late. Uh, we are meant to be carbon neutral by 2050. So we have 29 years uh, basically uh, left to catch up. Okay, what we need to do this on a process. Basically, also, we need to do it across the board, whether it is in terms of the way businesses do business. Uh, we spoke about tourism just before this question. Uh, I was reading a report which said that the new tourist is going to be the conscious tourist, the conscious traveler. And we're also going to see probably people traveling for longer stays and less frequently. Uh, before we had the phenomena of people traveling less frequently, more frequently, sorry, but for shorter stays. Now we're going to be seeing the inverse. People will not be traveling for five days, but for 10 days. People will not be traveling for one week, but for two weeks. Now, when, when measuring tourism, you usually measure tourism by numbers, by nights, and by expenditure. And it's usually a numbers-driven game. Today, we need to realize that the future of tourism is not a numbers-driven game in terms of the total number of tourists that reach our shores. But we need to look and measure the nights. We need to look and measure at the expenditure. Which therefore also means that the business model of the type of tourism we want to attract to our country also needs to change in terms of the new focus that even the post-COVID traveler is going to take. The conscious traveler who's going to be wanting to have an environment which is not the herded environment that we had before. So people want to see cleaner skies, and we had cleaner skies with COVID, was people traveling less. People want to see more open spaces and so forth. So this is going to change the nature of things. Coming back to the green economy, obviously, so we need to change basically the way we construct. We need to have more of what is known as sustainable development. It mustn't be only a buzzword. Our modes of transportation have to radically change. If there's one thing we noticed over the past few months is that there are less cars on the road and yet work is getting done. So the whole concept of remote working is changing. The whole concept of the office space is going to change. So we are realizing today that we don't need to build as much to create as much as office space as we thought we needed a year ago. Why? Because with remote working, people don't need to occupy the same amount of space they occupied before. Mario, you're bringing in you're bringing in topics. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Uh, on, on. Things are radically changing. No, oh, they are. They are. They are. They are. Um, unfortunately, I have five minutes left, and I'm already being told to. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, as I said, with with the four of you, we we can go on and on. It's very very interesting. Many topics to discuss. Um, but I'm told to 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 try and get to the last comments from the four of you. Okay. Sorry about David, that. I'm, no, no, no. David, David, I'm gonna I'm going to start with you. Um, today, I think both the leader of the opposition and the prime minister gave some press conferences regarding the environment. Could it be a topic where we get cross-party support on direction, etc., or is it going to be another one of these political uh, footballs? They First of all, it, if we do, it would make me extremely proud. <laughs> uh, because we, I, I strongly believe, the Chamber of Commerce strongly believes that the zero carbon economy and all that work that we can do to drive towards that by 2050 could be a solution towards an economy which is the right, the right kind. That is, that focuses on the social foundation that will increase the quality of life of all of our people. At the same time, doing that within the remits of the resources that our country uh, can offer. And that is, then we talk about, of course, the consequential quality of the air, quality of the water, quality of the food. Ultimately, COVID has 
fast forwarded our thinking process on how important that ambition is. It is not quite so much necessarily that of saving the world, but rather in having the, our, the ability to be able to focus on our health, physical and mental, which are very important, uh, the, the, the quality of our life, which is becoming even more important, the type of jobs that we will have, the, digit, the using of digitalization, AI, and therefore being more creative than we are um, uh, repetitive, and ultimately, ultimately um, focusing on what the world truly needs, what the traveler coming to Malta truly wants, what our manufacturing industry, what our services industry will really need to serve. Yep. We don't yep. have a choice. The world has made that choice for us. That common goal, which I saw, which I experienced myself last year when we launched the economic vision and we had government, uh, government launching its own economic vision at the chamber and the, the opposition uh, pretty much agreeing to it, gives me hope. And if we are aligned as a country, cross party, cross um, number of governments that we will have in the next 30 odd years, that gives me hope that the educational system and therefore the investment that we're putting in our kids today will bear fruit yeah. in the economy and the quality of life of our, of our future generations in the next uh, 20, 30 years and more. Sure. I mean, I'm sure like all of you, what one thing I really appreciate, uh, appreciated during COVID is how beautiful Malta is. You know, I've found places that I ignored or I didn't appreciate and, you know, in more, we're here, the weather, the, I, I, we really need to, we really need to protect that. Good, and final comments, I'll give you a minute. Well, I think that we're all um, uh, agreeing that when uh, the country is facing significant challenges, it has, in the history, shown remarkable ability to come together and uh, face these to overcome them. From the issue of anti-money laundering, which I believe is very much also a question of a culture which needs to be changed. Uh, institutions, of course, can change. Banks can change, but unless there's also the entire population in the business community that is participating in this effort, then the credibility of whatever we do will be to a great extent uh, than this. Culture when it comes to environmental uh, management and uh, behaviors, culture when it comes to compliance with uh, the proper ways of doing the business and uh, sustainable consumption, circular economy, you mentioned green, for us it's especially also a blue economy that you must uh, take into account. Given these challenges and the goodwill, I am very optimistic that uh, we are on the right path uh, towards uh, future development and growth over the next five years to a decade. Thanks, Gordon. Mario, one minute. I mean, we're all looking forward to the new normal, David. Uh, undoubtedly, the new normal is going to be a different normal, but the different normal is not necessarily going to be a bad normal. I think uh, from what we've been discussing for the past hour and a half, uh, we have loads of challenges, but from these loads of challenges, we also have loads of opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and I think we need to all look forward to them. Uh, as we all know, the market adjusts. The market adjusts rapidly. The market adapts rapidly to the new normalities and the future that we hope for us all. I think there's a lot of skill on this island, there's a lot of resources. I think if we all get our heads together, we can really move forward out of this situation we are in. Uh, we're in a health crisis, uh, but which has also created an economic crisis. Okay, however, let's look forward to what can beckon tomorrow. Thanks, Mario. Minister? Yes, so the two main challenges that we have ahead of us is that we make sure that we vaccinate as quickly as possible um, uh, the biggest and the largest amount of people in the coming months. There are going to be um, additional um, vaccines uh, from, from um, new companies coming in uh, over March and April, and that will help us to ensure that mass vaccination perhaps can, occur, can, can take place uh, before summer, and that would be extremely helpful so that, of course, we relax uh, the measures that we have in place. Second, we have to continue with the, the momentum that uh, has been in place since last 
April in order to make sure that the necessary help gets to businesses such that, of course, the achievements that we've managed to secure so far uh, will continue to be there in order to make sure that unemployment in Malta remains slow. And at the same time, of course, the economy is in place and safeguarded such that uh, when the recovery uh, will start to take place, our economy can start to grow once again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your candor. I hope all the attendees found it as interesting as I did. Um, I'm just going to leave with my parting shot is that how I would like to encourage all of us to work together for the benefit of water. We do have a beautiful country. We have lots of opportunities. We are facing many challenges, but the best way to get through that is by doing that together. And I'm sure we'll come out of it better if we manage to do that. So thank you very, very much, everyone. Good night. <laughs>